Jürgen, it's uh, nice to uh, have you uh, here. Uh, you've been one of the uh, editors of the SMI version 2 uh, standards. What uh, problems of the first version of SMI did uh, version 2 uh, solve? Well, actually, if you look back into the history of the SMI language, the very first language version wasn't really a language. So when SNP was created initially, there was an informal description of what the various objects are and what they mean. And it was later on that a document got published which was titled Concise MIP Definitions. And the reason was that there was a need to make the metadata machine readable. And uh, the tool of choice back in those days was to use ASN1 because there was a popular uh, language to specify protocol formats. And so at that time ASN1 was picked and uh, ASN1 has a macro mechanism so you can actually have application specific uh, mechanisms implemented in ASN1 and that, that is how what we now call SMI v1 got created but actually the history is one. But, but Back in the day when SM, SMP v2 was created there was a need to revise the SMI language itself uh, because uh, the protocol could support new data types and at the same time uh, people wanted to have more machine readable information they wanted to be able to express conformance definitions uh, which were kind of mingled into the object definitions in SMI v1, but they got separated out. Uh, people went as far as being able to describe uh, implementation limitations in a machine readable form, also called agent capabilities. And one, one of the big things that got introduced was a reusable, uh, reusable data type definition mechanism called extra conventions. Um, if, if, if you look at newer versions of, uh, say, SNMP, so SNMP version 2. One of the main differences is also the fact that you can use notifications instead of traps. Was that something introduced with SMI version 2 or could you have done that with SMI version 1 as well? Well, notifica notifications are essentially just a generalization of the original trap concept. So the concept, the, the original protocol had a very restrictive format in how notifications can be identified. And in SNMP v2, that got generalized, and as a consequence, there was a need to have a different way of defining them. Um, so that went hand in hand, and, and making the notification mechanism in the protocol more generic caused the, the change in the SMI language. What is the status now of SMI v2? Is it a full, stat, uh, full standard? It's full standard signing since 1998 or something like that. So people who still refer to SMI version 1, they should get updated. And uh, that, that was an interesting decision at that point in time because uh, the ITF has a number of MIP modules published that are in SMI v1 format. When SMI v2 became full standard, um, it didn't make sense to declare SMI v1 historic because we have a number of documents that depend on it. And it was not feasible to revise all those documents and to republish them. And as a consequence, SMI v1 is still a standard. Uh, it's a not recommended standard. So it got labeled as a standard, but you shouldn't use it. So all new activities will use SMI v2? Since, since 1998, actually before that even, uh, all the ITF modules were written in SMI v2 format. Some, some people know about, say, SMI version 1, SMI version 2, SNMP version 1, SNMP version 2, and SNMP version 3. Uh, is there any relation between the numbers of SNMP and the numbers of, of SMI, or can you use the combinations in whatever way you want? You can actually use them in, in any combination. So the version numbers are really distinct, uh, the SMI version number and the SNMP version number. You can carry SMI v1 specified MIP modules in SNMP v3. You can carry SMM, SMI v2 MIP modules with a little with a few restrictions in SNMP v1. Uh, the restrictions are 64 bit data types that are in the SMI v2, but not in the SNMP v1. So, so, so it's not the version numbering that plays a role for v2 and SMI v2, that, that it somehow is related to each other. It's just. It came along at the same time, mm -hmm. but then afterwards developed a life that is independent. Is there still a need to further develop the SMI version 2? I remember you've been active on the SMI Next, uh, next Generation NG. Yes, yeah, so we, we started a project uh, at the end of the 80s 
And the motivating factor at that point in time was that there was a big wave on doing policy-driven network management. And as part of that, new protocols appeared like COPSBR. And COPSBR had a data modeling language that was called SPBI, and it was very close to SMIV2. But COPSBR had certain restrictions and certain extensions. And people got concerned that within standardization bodies like the IETF, you might have to specify so-called PIP modules for COPSPR and MIP modules for SNP usage. And that was would duplicate effort. So the, the research question that we took on at that point in time was, is it possible to have a data modeling language that is a little bit more protocol neutral and where you can define the binding to a concrete protocol as an extension to the core data model, which should be protocol neutral? That was the original idea behind the SMING project. And it started more like an individual research project. It even became a working group at some point in time. Um, it didn't really succeed in the working group. We published the RFC, so you can actually read what we did. But probably more interesting to read is a comic paper that Cut published a couple of years ago, where we summarized the lessons that we learned. Um, because it's much more complicated to do this than we originally thought. And we captured some of those lessons there. But that activity on SMING was started, uh, say, in the late 90s. Yes. And um, when did it stop, more or less? Um, it went into the IETF at the beginning of the century, but then stopped. I don't really recall the exact date. I think we published, so the, the SMING specifications then went to the NMRG and got published out of the NMRG in 2003, I think. That's good. But you're now one of the, say, uh, editors of Yang, and you're behind the development of Yang, uh, which you use for NetConf. Can you compare SMING with Yang? Is there a logical follow-up? Um, so the funny thing is when Yang was generated, um, many of the original design decisions uh, of the Yang language were actually taken from SMING. Mm -hmm. Um, so syntactic questions, uh, questions concerning the base data type system and so on, were all incorporated from SMING. But then, of course, based on the experience that it's really hard to build a protocol neutral data modeling language, Yang by design was not designed to be protocol neutral. And so it's tightly um, bound to the abstraction that the net protocol uses and, and the way it has special capabilities in the Yang language to control how NetConf would process certain requests. So at the end, SMIG failed in the, in the IETF when it was an SMIG project, but it was still useful because uh, parts of it survived. Okay. And how is Yang standardization currently running? Um, Yang has been, the language itself has been very successful. Um, there's a specification, um, there are fewer bugs that people uncovered. Uh, but most of it turns out to be pretty stable and uh, we have multiple inter interoperable implementations, so that's doing pretty well. Coming back to NetConf, um, can you somehow use NetConf in combination with uh, SN SNMP MIP modules or these two separate worlds? I so saw you've done some work on mapping. So. Yeah, so that, that must be, that's of course a common question if people have existing SNMP code bases, can you actually access the instrumentation that you already have in an automated way through NetCon? Now, uh, in terms of reading data, this is a solved problem. There's an RFC that actually tells you how you take a MIP module and convert it into a, a Yang module, so you can actually get a Yang representation of the data model and then access it through NetCon. When it comes to writing, then the underlying models, how data is stored and how the persistency of data is uh, managed, is fundamentally different between NetCon and SNMP. And that kind of prevents an automated translation. So essentially, translation is read only because um, in SNMP, every design of the module has the complete freedom to define how something is made persistent. That comes a certain concept, a certain model of how to deal with persistency, and so you can't automatically translate. 
so you lose certain data, certain information if you translate from SNMP MIP modules to net conf configurations? Well, that's just a read-only translation. Yes. Yeah, sorry. You wouldn't be able to, to do a meaningfully automated translation mm -hmm. um, for writable. Um, until now, we've been talking about your work on, uh, say, data modeling, but you have also been quite active in the development of uh, SNMP v3 security. Um, can you tell a little bit more on what you did there and what problems it solved? So SNMP v3 security uh, originally was based on the old SNMP model that everything has to be self-contained mm -hmm. and as a consequence um, the SNMP v3 user-based security model um, incorporates everything and you need to change keys and to establish keys to uh, I, I define identities and so forth. Now, was that a wrong decision, if you look back? Um, I believe that was the wrong decision. Um, the reason is that security, the cryptographic mechanisms of security are reasonably well understood. Um, what, what is really the challenge is key management and identity management. And the fact that SNMP came with its own solution made it relatively expensive uh, for an operator to establish yet another key management system. And so operators were very reluctant and they said, well, we already know how to manage identities using for other protocols like SSH access to boxes. Um, and we're not willing to invest the same amount of effort to manage keys just for securing SNMP access. But what did they do then? Did they embrace SSH or TLS? Or? Well, operators reported that to the IETF and the IETF chartered a working group uh, to work on how to run SNMP over SSH and how to run SNMP over TLS and DTLS. And uh, that working group found out that the architectural model of SNMP wasn't very flexible in doing that because it assumed that the security is provided within the SNMP processing, but now it's, the security is provided essentially as part of the transport. And so in order to fit that into the architecture, we actually had to change the architecture a little bit to make that work. If you would now recommend an operator uh, to use SNMP with a certain security model, what would you advise? Probably not the original USAC. Uh, would it be TLS, DTLS? Uh, would it be uh, SSH? Um, so uh, out of the so there was some interoperability testing of uh, the TLS and DTLS security models. There surely are interoperable implementations out there. Uh, this is less so for SSH. Um, so it seems if you're interested in using a more standard security mechanism, you're likely to go for TLS or DTLS, uh, less likely for SSH. Okay. Thanks a lot for this interview. You're welcome. <laughs>